So I'm going to get to share with you some stories largely from the Exxon Valdez uh, experience, which I still am working on uh, more than 20 years after the spill, and also talk to you about microbes, uh, bacteria in particular. Uh, and we'll go through the story, if the slides will advance. First of all, um, daily I get up now, and many of you get up, and we watch this uh, feed of oil pouring into the Gulf, and, and we see this and, and we say what a major impact this is going to have, and particularly we then see the tragic photos of uh, pelicans, um, dolphins, um, turtles, other organisms with oil all over them and uh, gut-wrenching sorts of pictures which undoubtedly bring many of us to the room here today. Um, and, and we raise our hands and fists and, and we yell about uh, what BP in fact has done. What we don't see is what's going on in the world of bacteria where uh, it's very, very different. For a bacterial cell, at least for hundreds of species of bacteria, oil is a food source. They are going to um, grow on this. We're going to increase the numbers of bacteria, and in doing so, they're going to decrease the amount of oil and eventually get rid of much of it over a period of time. Now, it's hard through the lights to see those faces in the audience, but I'm sure some of you are reeling back and going, no, not bacteria, they all cause disease. Um, as you're thinking of that, you might take a look at the person next to you and as you do so, uh, recognize that they are 90% bacteria and only 10% human. And when you go back and <laughs> look at yourselves in the mirror, you, you have the same thing and thought. Also, if you go back to the 60s, when we thought we'd run out of food but never have a problem with the amount of oil to fuel the world, BP was busy building the largest fermenters in the world to grow these bacteria on oil to feed you. The idea was your dinner tonight would be a plate full of bacteria. And BP wasn't foolish enough to think that you would just relish these slimy bacteria. They entered into contracts with the major chocolate manufacturers so you would sit down and have a wonderful dinner of chocolate covered bacteria and that was going to feed uh, the world. Well, we've run short on oil, we drill, and the consequences are in fact spillages like we're now seeing in the Gulf. What's happening to that oil that enters? Um, the amount that we can't pick up um, on the beaches with shovels and sand um, or that we can skim or burn is going to undergo natural weathering. And in the first days, we're going to lose many of the toxic components like benzene. They're going to evaporate into the air. They're going to dissolve and dilute to concentrations that are not going to be toxic to fish or other organisms. But then we're going to be left with another suite of chemicals which are going to be subject to microbial attack over time. This does not occur instantly. This is not something that's gone tomorrow, despite the companies that I'll talk about shortly that are peddling um, the 24-hour solution to this oil spill. What we see over weeks and months will be some compounds being lost as they're attacked by bacteria, and then later, yet others. And in the end, though, we're going to be left with some compounds. They're going to be largely inert. They're going to be like the asphalt roads that we drive on, and where children drop their lollipops, pick them up, eat them, and don't die instantly from that. Uh, so this is a slower process. It's going to um, occur. And eventually, the slide will advance. The hydrocarbons are going to be consumed by bacteria. And what we discovered um, now 40 years ago was that you could speed up the process by adding a fertilizer. Just as you have your lawn and you want it to be greener, you throw a fertilizer on it and the grass grows better. If you can add a fertilizer to the oil uh, and do so safely, you can get the bacteria to grow faster. And as I said, 40 years ago we discovered that. Let me go back a slide if I can. Um, and this was work done for the U.S. Navy, and the very first thing the Navy had me do was actually go and brief Jacques Cousteau on our finding and, and begin a conversation of the role of bacteria in the ecology of the oceans. And it was sort of crude work, not just crude oil, but crude work with hoses and not the modern molecular biology that many of us practice today. Well, what is this bioremediation? 
Let's see how it works. works. The fertilizers, shown here in green, add nitrogen and phosphorus to the environment. With a balance of nutrients, the fertilizers stimulate the growth of native bacteria, shown in purple. More bacteria ingest more oil. After the microbes consume all the degradable hydrocarbons, they return to their original numbers and natural hydrocarbon food sources. I think the important point here is these are native bacteria. They are naturally occurring in the Gulf. In fact, the region where the current oil spill is occurring has 63 natural seepages that pump 20 million gallons of oil every year into the Gulf of Mexico, and that oil is not washing up on the beaches. The current oil is because these bacteria are, in fact, consuming it naturally. Well, there are four key factors that I'd point to in looking at bioremediation as to whether or not you can speed up this rate of degradation. One is the actual nutrient levels. If they're low, then you need to think about adding a fertilizer. The other factor would be oxygen, where we need oxygen to be present if we're going to get rapid degradation. Third factor would be flowing water, particularly in shorelines where it gets into marshes. If we don't get nutrient exchange, if you don't get an influx of water, we're going to have a problem. And then you're going to have to weigh the uh, benefits versus the um, risks of any treatment, and that includes bioremediation. Well, as I say, we studied this extensively in the Exxon Valdez spill, and while the environments are in fact quite different as illustrated in these photos, and the magnitude of oil at least 10 times larger currently in the Gulf than we had seen in Prince William Sound, there are still a number of lessons to be learned. First of all, if you're going to look at this technology, you better be able to demonstrate its efficacy and its safety. And this involves extensive laboratory testing and field testing with detailed chemical analyses that are extraordinarily expensive to prove. This is not something where you can just look at something and say 100% of the oil is gone or 90% of the oil is gone. It requires a very carefully controlled scientific experiment. When this was done in the Exxon Valdez spill, we were able to demonstrate that you could safely enhance the rates of degradation by a factor of two to five. Now, that's not maybe an awful lot, but if the spill was going to take a decade of impact, you might reduce the impact to two years to five years. It's significant. Um, in the current spill, think of the same sorts of numbers. As this graph shows, maybe you could have enhanced it more, maybe 10 times, except then you're adding so much fertilizer that maybe you're going to see algal growth or, or other effects that you don't want. So we erred on the side of safety, even though we might have enhanced things more. Now, one of the experiences I had with the Exxon Valdez spill was that everyone proposed a solution, and we're seeing that today. I get a call just about every day from someone who has a solution, and they can clean up the spill within a day. Um, one of the groups that came to Exxon, where I had the job of scientifically evaluating, um, had duck feathers, like hair, but they were peddling it as a bioremediation solution, and when I didn't accept that, they threw the feathers all over me. Um, the other was orange peels and lemon peels. And if, like in the Gulf, you decide that you can tell whether oil is present or not by smelling it, and you throw enough orange peels and lemon peels on it, you don't smell the oil anymore, then it must be 100% biodegraded, or so um, they argued. And we didn't buy that for Exxon. But I unfortunately had the experience some years ago, of, or some years after the Exxon spill, of going to the jungle in Ecuador to study a spill in the Amazonian jungle. And there proudly were the engineers with the workers throwing orange peels and lemon peels on the oil saying, you see, it's 100% degraded. You don't smell it anymore. Not so. And then there were all the people selling bacteria. Um, and it would be nice if we had a superbug that could clean up the spill but they'd have to compete in nature with the bacteria that have already colonized the spill and a complex community of bacteria, and we just don't have that. And so while I get those daily calls, it doesn't work that way. It's not that fast, and we don't have the ability to just throw non-native bacteria. 
What does work is fertilizer, and any number of different types of fertilizer will work depending on the environment you're dealing with. In the case of the Exxon spill, two fertilizers were actually applied. One in a pole, which was an oleophilic or oil-loving fertilizer. And the idea here was in Prince William Sound, with all the water washing in and out over the rocks, you wanted the fertilizer to stick to the oil. You didn't want it washing out just freely into Prince William Sound, where it might have adverse ecological effects. The other was a slow release fertilizer, so you could add it and not have to come back for some time. Well, what we could show is that the red line here showed we speeded up the rate. The blue line was a control actually in the field, and the rate was slow. You'll notice the blue line doesn't go the full length of the red lines, and the reason is when I briefed the admiral in charge of the on-scene coordination for the spill, and showed him our data, he said, okay, we're bioremediating. We're using the technology. And I said, good, we'll continue the science. He said, no, son, this is the real world. This is a real world oil spill. We're pouring fertilizer over your controls. There's no room for science in the real world, was the statement he made. Well, I'd argue there is a need for science if we're going to advance in this world. But that blue line did not continue. We did bioremediate the controls. Um, we're hearing a lot, oops, let's go back again a slide, um, in the Gulf about oxygen depletion with plumes of oil moving subsea. In fact, um, we did see when we added fertilizer at different times that the uh, red line would go down, but it never went to zero. It never went to the point where fish would die, but we did see a depletion to about the level that's been reported by some scientists studying the spill in the early days. The other thing that we heard about already this morning and ongoing is the use of dispersants. Again, bacteria are different perhaps than other organisms in their response, but in this case, when you get smaller droplets, when you have more surface area, when you disperse the oil, bacteria grow faster. So if you're a bacterium, adding dispersants is a good thing. Um, if you really dilute the oil to non-toxic levels, it's good. Otherwise, all bets are off. Well, let me tell a story about a misunderstanding about bioremediation, and the punchline is up here, it's alive. I was briefing the admiral about bioremediation when an Exxon employee came in and said, I need the microbiologist. And you don't interrupt admirals. And, and the admiral glared at the Exxon person and said, out. And the Exxon person said, no, we need the microbiologist now. And entered the room and physically grabbed me and pulled me out of the room and shoved me into a waiting truck, which raced at high speed to a helicopter with its blades whirling and pushed me in. I had no idea why or where I was going. Well, the helicopter flew out over Prince William Sound. I had my headphones on, and I hear the pilot radio to the Exxon Valdez, Exxon Valdez permission to land. And the radio comes back, permission denied, we're under quarantine. It's not a good thing to hear. And he says, we have the microbiologist, and he gets the word, land immediately. And we dive for the bow of the Exxon Valdez and land. They push me out, and the helicopter flies off. I'm first time on an oil tanker, and a seaman grabs me. We start running to the back of the ship, not walking, but running. And everyone's yelling, it's alive, do something. Well, they push me in the hold of the tanker, and I wind up winding my way through oil staircase down the stories to the waterline where there are literally thousands of jellyfish calling bacteria off the oil. The seamen had seen the jellyfish, assumed jellyfish were bacteria, and they were going to rise up out of the tank like the Andromeda strain and consume the seamen. Um, I came up out of the tank, bang, they let me out. I said, jellyfish, they said, okay, you can have a steak dinner on the bridge. And, and, you know, we celebrated the success of bioremediation. Well, <laughs> Exxon did go on in a full-scale operation with thousands of individual applications over hundreds of miles uh, of shoreline to, in fact, apply fertilizer in a very simple procedure where people would either spread like you do on your lawn the granule fertilizer or we would spray fertilizer on. And you can see the map. Um, for the first couple of years, fertilizer was applied extensively in Prince William Sound. The result was that within a couple of years, not tomorrow, but over a couple of years, 
The yellow in the first 1989, which shows the extent of oiling, by 1992, after bioremediation had been applied, it's hard to see the dots, but there's still some yellow dots. And then by 2001, 99.6% of the oil, according to NOAA, is gone from Prince William Sound. Is it all gone? Not quite. There are still some shorelines that have some sequestered buried oil that is like paint in a paint can. There's no water flowing through it. It's not exposing the biota. Uh, some of it is extensively degraded. Some of it not so degraded. Uh, the green dots in here are background, no oil. Um, down near the waterline, there's no oil. In some of the higher intertidal zones, at a few beaches, this one with 44% of all the oil that's left in Prince William Sound, you can see patchy distribution, some degraded, some not. Well, what does all this mean for the current Gulf? What do we expect? I don't expect the oil to go away tomorrow. I expect this problem is going to be with us for some years. Hopefully, they will shut off the flow of the oil in August, and then we'll watch the oil slowly weather. We'll continue to physically collect what we can. Some of that's going to escape collection. It's going to move out in the ocean in the currents. It's going to be food for bacteria. Some of it's going to come into shorelines where it's going to be more damaging to try and go in and physically clean up the oil, we're going to allow it to weather. At some point, we may well decide on a strategy in those cases of adding some fertilizer and speeding up the rate. Uh, Ten years from now, we're still likely to find some patches of oil that we can attribute to this spill. Hopefully, the ecological impact as will decrease as it has in Prince William Sound, and we'll be back to our normal ecology. So hope for the long run, problems in the short. Thank you.